Okay, we're back. Sorry, I got cut off there for a minute, but no yeah, problem. Your books. My books. So yeah, this is the one we're concentrating on now. Okay. The Vickers Knickers. Now that is uh, here. Uh, I had to shut off a, a, a alert. Um, yeah. So this one tells the uh, initial um, origin story of this cast of characters, and uh, mm -hmm. the, the liquor vicar is Tony Vicker, and he gets a job at the liquor store and. Uh, He's a failed musician, and uh, he has a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on in his mind and heart that he doesn't fully appreciate. And uh, uh, he gets into an adventure, and uh, some things happen that are quite bizarre. And, uh, and so, and then in book two, the Vickers Knickers is the pub that he opens. It's called the Vickers Knickers, and there's a huge adventure involved in in the opening of the pub and the building of the pub and the publicity of the pub. And I'm, I'm giving you the most brief uh, explanation, but he has, he has some stuff going on around him that is very difficult to explain and uh, almost spooky. I hope it's not autobiographical. <laughs> well, I mean, any novelist includes things that have happened to them. For sure. I mean, it's unavoidable. You just... You just have to. That's how you see the world is through your own experience. So, I mean, every character probably has a teensy bit of me in them, I would have to guess. And uh, every story is either true and adapted for the book or uh, based on truth and adjusted for the book. You know, there, I've, been, I've seen and been through some completely hilariously bizarre things in my life. So... I, I want to share them in, in this way. I mean, I remember I was talking to you online a few weeks ago. I went to see Brian Adams here in Summerside, PEI. Mm -hmm. And a very good friend of yours was playing the drums. Yeah, right. Pat Pat Stewart. And he, he's been doing that off and on for decades. And now I think he's I think he's got the gig again full time because I think Mickey Curry might, uh, might have retired or, you know. I remember so. seeing Pat. Um, well, I used to live in Mississauga, Ontario. Right. I and um, I lived, uh, I used to work next to a roller rink. And I went over there after work one night, and uh, the odds were shooting a video. <laughs> I got to meet the whole band, and Bruce McCullough was there. And yeah, yeah. It was really something. And then I guess it was before I moved out here to Prince Edward Island, I went to see the odds at the Horseshoe. They were doing an anniversary performance of the entire Good Weird Feeling album. Right. And it was like, it was like Canadian royalty in the 90s for music. Uh, Tom Wilson was there. Yeah. Stephen yeah. Page was there that night. Sloan was there. Yeah. Um, Pursuit of Happiness was all hanging out there. It was quite an evening to be there, actually. And uh, Well, that's that's Craig, right? Craig Northey of the odds. He is Mr. Connected. He knows more people, and he has written or co-written for more people than anyone else. Anyone else in this country? I don't. I cannot think of anybody as as connected as Craig. I mean, they're a fabulous band of musicians too. Like, oh, they're I mean, tremendous. And they were nice guys. Like I really enjoyed meeting them. Like I mean, it was they they were joking around from the time I saw them. And <laughs> it's just... well, they're, they're brilliantly funny and highly intelligent. And uh, well, I mean, that's my crowd, right? When I moved to Vancouver, I clicked in with those guys before any of these bands before the spirits and stuff existed there was mm -hmm. you know all these guys trying to build little bands and we all played in each other's bands and filled in and pat and i swapped gigs consistently we did a lot of the same gigs through the years right and i, I played in various top 40-ish things with with craig with doug elliott doug and i played so much through the years you know, he's he and Pat were very, very close as a rhythm section. But then when Pat would go away, it would be me and Doug. And so, you know, it became equally close, but just a different flavor. Did you know their original drummer? Paul? Yeah. Paul Brennan? Yeah, very, very well. Because I remember he went and played for Big Sugar for a while. I saw him yeah, play with Big yeah, Sugar yeah, once. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he ended up going back to Ontario or going to Ontario. I can't remember if he came, there from, came from there originally. I don't recall, but yeah, he, he was, his mission as a musician was to be a stylist, whereas mine right. was to be, to be as multi-capable stylistically as I could be. His was to build a sound that was purely him and nobody else. So 
you know, his is a, is a very long game. Right. Long game. But he, he did it. He definitely did it. I can't go without mentioning, um, I saw your your gig at Massey Hall, and it was the last time I got to see you guys together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was truly a magical evening for me to have that last opportunity to see you guys in a place like that. It was... It must have been amazing for you guys to play there. Um, yeah, bittersweet. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was nice. It was nice, but I just, you know, John was still able to do the show, but it was really showing by that point that his right. his cognitive cognitive functions had started to decrease quite rapidly and quite uh, quite thoroughly and. I wish we could have enjoyed that in, in our salad days, you know? Right. But okay. there was a bittersweetness. And then and then Pete McCormick, who I've mentioned before, the filmmaker, he came and he filmed that for for a, a uh, special, which also ended up in the Spirit movie, which he directed. It, it was a really well done documentary. I thought it was something that was long overdue by, I think, I, in, of my the Canadian bands, I think you guys are well up there with anybody. Um, well, it, it's funny because it, it, I find it really interesting that in the same year, we lost Spirit of the West, Rush, and the Tragically Hip. I know. And I I lump you guys in there because I think you guys are just as important to Canada as those other two guys are. Well, in our own way, we were, but we we didn't have that massive international fame that Rush had, or or that uh, loved as much as hockey thing that the Hip have, you know. But, I mean, um, you name a person that went to college between 1987 and, you know, 2000 that doesn't know Home for a Rest. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's that, the, that that's the impact, that song alone. But, I mean, I personally think Venice is Sinking was a bigger hit, but that's just... Uh, as far as the stats are concerned, it's nowhere near as big a hit, but it, it has great meaning and, and it, it's greatly loved. But... <clears throat> I think that we brought also a certain vibe of good humor and a family feeling. You did. That, that is more than the other two groups aforementioned. You know, that, that was kind of, we were like the bloody Von Trapp family sometimes, dragging kids on stage. And <laughs> it, was a, it was a pretty, yeah. I, I want to say wholesome, but it wasn't like Pat Boone wholesome. It was like, nah, we're having a beer with our kids. Yeah. That kind of that kind of healthy Canadian wholesome, you know, for sure. Everybody, everybody's included. Everyone's loved. Everyone's treasured. You know, that was a very big part of us. I mean, I went to see you every chance. Every time you came to the GTA, I went to see you, see you guys. I know. It was something. I know. I, it was something I just look forward to. It's like, when are they coming back? I got. I we went to Ottawa to see you guys at the Governor General's property. Oh, you were at that show. Yeah, the outdoor one just before Canada Day. Yeah, we did two of those actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you played a lot of stuff from Star Trails that night, and I was like, I can't wait to get this record. It sounds awesome. Yeah. Like it was a, that's a well done album too, as far as I'm concerned. But mm, but you. I remember you saying a lot of that, and I just was like, man, I can't wait to pick up the CD. It sounds awesome. And I was on Young Street at Sam the Record Man when you did oh the uh, when you did the in store performance. Yeah, I remember Jeff was in a bad mood that day. <laughs> He's very he, cranky. He didn't I, like doing in stores, especially outdoors with the heat sun beating down on you. It's like, Yay. I think I remember somebody asking you guys to play Home for a Rest, and he goes, no, we're not going to play that damn song, but if you come out to Burlington tonight, we'll play it. <laughs> and I remember, yeah, laugh, I, I remember laughing. I thought, man, you might, I don't know. Did you guys ever get tired of playing that song? Not really, no. No? Cause it, no, it, no, I mean, it... All of our songs got appreciation and love from the audience. So it wasn't like there was dead silence and crickets until Home for Arrest. We didn't right. resent it for its success. You know, it was just, it was the, the top banana in the songs. And yeah. uh, we worked really hard to make sure that, that that climax at the end of the show was as big as humanly possible. I mean, we, we took it very seriously. I can honestly say that I never, nobody that I can think of ever phoned in a spirit show, not once in 30 some years. 
Not any time I saw you, you didn't, that's for sure. No, even if the audience was smaller or the, the equipment was failing or whatever, we never phoned it in. We took it very seriously and we were fully aware of how lucky we were to do what we did and be as appreciated as we were. We knew that. Now, I mean, you took us so seriously. You you really took it to another level, though, and you. I did. Yeah, I guess I did. Um, I don't know. I think the first time I saw you, you guys had me hooked. When I saw you in Hamilton at the Festival of Friends in Gage Park, you had me hooked right from the beginning. Like, and I remember buying a hat and I got it signed by all you guys. And I just remember how amazingly friendly you guys were well, with everybody. Didn't we bring you on stage once? You did. <laughs> Didn't, Actually, didn't, what, didn't something really special happen when we when I brought you on stage? Come, yes, and come to mention. Do you want to tell your your viewers what that was? Yes, this man here, Vince, Vince allowed me to go up on stage and propose to my wife, who, as a matter of fact, tomorrow is our thirteenth wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations! That's so, wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a night I won't ever forget. That was a. Uh, yeah, well, I think. Yeah, I think you've made fun of me a couple of times about how nervous I was. You could see. Oh, it you were pretty... nervous as a cat. <laughs> just, uh, because not not only do you have to say something that is quite emotional and yeah, I mean it makes a man nervous. You're doing it in front of several hundred people. You know, maybe I don't know. I don't remember the the size of the venue, but it was pretty big. And there was a pretty some good friends of yours in the audience that night too. I think Howard was there. Oh yes, Howard uh, Howard Weiss. He, Who I still speak he, with online. I just I got I got a, a text from him about an hour ago. He was here on PEI this summer seeing Alan Doyle's play. Right, right. He's and, a huge fan. And uh, I think uh, Judy, who became a friend of mine. Yeah, Judy is one of our oldest fans. Uh, do you remember there was a, a group called the the Judy Bats? No. There was a band, an alternative kind of pop band. Back in the old days, they were called the Judy Bats. And so we started calling Judy and her clutch of friends. There was a small clutch of and They were all right. much beloved by us, Judy and Anne and a couple of other people. Um, we just called them the Bats. Okay. Put the, bat, put the Bats on the list. Bats on the list. They were always, it, anytime we were in Ontario, the Bats were on the list. Even if we were way up north or whatever. I remember some of the bands that opened for you guys that actually blew me away. Do you remember Odin Red? No. They opened for you at the Horseshoe. And I remember I blown away. I bought their CD, and then I saw my cousin in Ottawa two weeks later. She bought their CD. She saw them in Ottawa. <laughs> and they were a pretty you know good what? rock band. Mm, yeah, that was the Horseshoe, you see. We usually would come in really late um, because there's nowhere to go backstage there. It's no, just, really. it's tiny. So you just the sort of roll up. The bathroom downstairs, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. So you roll up in the alley, you get out of the vehicle, and you come into the club, and it's like, okay, we're on in 10 minutes. So the opening group is probably probably done by then, and moving their equipment around, and everybody's sure. jostling, and there's elbows, and, you know, so. Um, I also, I remember seeing you guys at a club in Toronto down by the waterfront, and uh, Dustin Bentall opened for you. Yeah. Dust. And I was I became a fan of his instantly when I saw him yeah. open for you guys. And um, actually, yeah. I think Kendall Carson was here. She did a gig with Alan Doyle last week. Well, she's full time with Alan. Yeah. She's yeah, Kenny is. She's a great fiddle player. She's she's an amazing human being, and I yeah. just adore her. We all do. We're uh, I don't know. We she is like one of the best people we know, and we 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 mm -hmm. love her. And, She's so talented. She's such a team player. She's hilarious. Has a very, very uh, highly nuanced sense of humor, and you know she loves to laugh. And, and her musical skills are very high. And her fiddle really added a lot of color to your performance that night. I remember. Yeah. Well, she was an unofficial member of the band. She she knew she was welcome to come and play with us at any time. Anytime she could be, it didn't matter where she was welcome. She could come spend the whole show on stage. It did not matter because I mean, I, there's a long story that goes with this, but I always tell it when we talk about Kenny, uh, I discovered her. <laughs> I mean, she was already a highly qualified musician, but I think she was, she's probably 
16 years old when somehow or other, oh God, I'd met her when we were doing some recording at a, at a I was doing some recording in, in Nanaimo, nearby where I live, mm -hmm. uh, and I had a little studio with, with a partner, and uh, she came in and did some stuff, and she said, geez, I'd really like to see Spirit of the West play, but I can never get into these places because I'm, I'm not old enough to, to drink, so you know right. I can't get in. And I said, hmm, we're playing a club in Victoria in a few weeks. Why don't I bring you in? Uh, through the through the kitchen, in essence, uh, <laughs> as a musician, you just bring your fiddle with you down into the room, right? And and if and I'll escort you right down, and then you'll be in. It'll be no problem. And uh, so she did that. She came out, and knocked on the the hotel door, and left her coat there. And I walked her down, and I said, "Everybody, this is Kendall Carson. She wants to see the group, and she's a very fine young fiddlist, and, and uh, a fiddly ossiter." And um, <laughs> and uh, they went, "Hello," you know. And she said, "Well, you know, I got I got my fiddle here. Uh, I think I could come up and play." I go, can she come up and play? Sure. Which one of our songs do you know? Do you know "Home for a Rest"? And, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know "Home for a Rest," <laughs> and it's pretty fast, you know. And she said, no, I can do it. I can do it any tempo. I can do it. So she comes up there and she's beside Jeff and just nails it. This little girl, you know, beautiful young blonde princess, you know, and she and Jeffrey's over there going, holy shit, she's really good. <laughs> and uh, and so um, afterwards we sat down and she's just over there chatting with John or something. And I said, man, isn't Kendall wonderful? And he's, he said, you know, the paper boys are looking for a fiddle player. And I said, well, she's looking for a gig. And he said, it's hers, just like that. And I went over and I said, Kendall, I think I got you a gig. And then after that, she was full time in the paper boys and with spirit anytime she was available, anytime she could come in and play with us. And, and uh, so that's, I always tell the story of how I discovered her. I snuck her into the, uh, the foundry or the forge or whatever it's called in Victoria. Did you guys ever come to PEI on tour? Yeah, we did once. I have some lovely photographs. But, you come uh, to Charlottetown, I'm guessing? We came to Charlottetown. Is there anywhere else I come to? Uh, Summerside's got some nice spots. Oh, um, Summerside's got a festival, actually, yes. Um, there's um, also the Clogaroo Festival out in the east end of the island. Um, no, we are in Charlottetown, and I think it was for like Canada Day weekend or something. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, Johnny had lost his voice and he had terrible laryngitis and we just had to limp through limp through the show. That was our one and only time. But I loved it. I loved wandering around the town and, and taking photographs. I've got some really good shots, good memories of that day. Another friend of yours I got to meet a few years ago before I moved here to PEI. Um, I went to a festival in Waterdown, Ontario, and I got the privilege of sitting right up to the stage and watching Barney Bentall play. Hmm. And I've always been a big fan of his since day one as well. And I really like his last record, the the one with the Drifter on it, and Dustin's on it as well, and Kendall plays fiddle on it. It's it's and, a truly and, and, and an amazing. Isn't Jeffrey or is I, Jeffrey? And he wrote a song about John on it too. Yeah, or dedicated yeah, Barn, it to John. He helped produce or did produce the very first Spirit of the West record called Spirit of the West. Right, and it was. It was recorded in a plywood mill. Really? Yeah. They set up they set up recording equipment inside this plywood mill. I, I, I don't know what the connection is between Barney and the plywood mill, but uh, but he, he's a great old friend of Jeffrey, and mm -hmm. uh, and then he became a great friend of all of us. You know, and he's he's a lovely, lovely man. He's he's really as much of a sweetheart as as he seems he would be and as his reputation indicates it's true but oh he truly was you, you, you can't you you could not get a bad word about somebody out of him you couldn't he's just it's gentle it's 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 almost unbelievable sometimes i got him to sign my lonely avenue cd as well as the new oh, one yeah. that he made um because even you know that that was their second big record but that one meant more to me than the first one like that whole album got me through some tough times and uh, 
I asked him if he play a song off, and he goes, I don't think I've played that song in 20 years. <laughs> yeah, so. well, right? You write uh, 150, 200 songs. Eventually, some of them have to go in the back seat. Yeah, I guess that happened to you guys a few times, because I remember somebody asked you to play uh, Scour the House, and it had been a while since you guys had played it. And, yeah. Well, part of the problem there, which we never talked about, was that uh, the song, the playlist itself, became quite calcified after a while, because right. Johnny just didn't have the mental flexibility anymore. And that was years before anybody knew anything right. was wrong. But I knew that there was something not right, but... Uh, we didn't even talk about it as a group for some time until I sort of forced the issue. You know, I, I said to Jeffrey one time after a particularly fraught weekend of forgotten lyrics and arrangement screw ups, I said, mm, something ain't right. This is not fatigue or anxiety. This is right. something, this is something else. And he said, Ooh, are you sure? Cause he does not like digging up stuff like that. He, he just right. he likes he likes to maintain an even strain, which I respect. But I couldn't do it because I was worried. I thought, no, there's something deeper going on here. And so I called John after I talked to Jeffrey about it at some length. I said, I think I'm going to call John and ask him if he senses it, you know. And he said, okay, this is scary. And I called John and he said, yeah, there's something going on. And I said, are, are you going to maybe talk to a doctor? He said, yes, I'm going to go and talk to a doctor. And he was just so he was fully aware of it and it was very brave about it. He didn't, he didn't get mad at me for, you know, as if I was accusing him of making too many mistakes because it, it was not that. And I, I communicated it in a way of, of concern because I mean, I'd been working with the guy at that point for almost 25 years. I knew what his baseline was of accuracy. Right. I knew it was very, very high, you know, world-class. I mean, for That's, sure. Right. And I just went, eh, this ain't right. This is happening all the time. And uh, so he went and then he found out that there was a problem. Then he went a second time and then he really knew it was that diagnosis. Speaking of, how are you doing these days? I know you had some scary times there for a little while with your kidneys. Yeah, I almost croaked, but then I got an aftermarket kidney from Costco. They, they have them there <laughs> over by the snow tires. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm feeling very good now. I'm you strong. Look, you look great. Thank you. You look great. I'm, you look very healthy. And I'm working out a lot. I'm walking like 10K a day. In fact, after we're done here, I'm going to go and walk 10K. Yeah. So. I got in a bike ride this morning, so I feel pretty good. Good for you. So, so I, for we, you. my wife and I both bought bikes this year. And we're, yeah, we had a rough year this year. I lost both my parents within three months of each other. Mm. So that was a rough year. Um, well, that well, we got, really says something about your parents too, if they go so quickly. I got my dad between each other. I got my dad back home though. He's originally from PEI, and he wanted to come back home after mom died, and we got him back here. It was only for a couple of months, but we got him home. So, so had he been in Mississauga? Uh, yeah, we lived in Mississauga most of our lives. Um, they were living in north of Newmarket, Ontario, when um, mom passed away. Uh, they'd been living there for about ten years. And we moved here two year, two and a half years ago. Um, we just couldn't afford Ontario anymore. It was getting ridiculous. It's just we were never going to buy a house there. Yeah, like I it know. was, it was we. You just couldn't get ahead. You just kept struggling for for what. So, you know, we've been people, living in the same house for thirty years, and we can barely afford it on yeah. Vancouver Island. Like the prices are out of this world. I bet. Yeah, it's just you know like three bedroom bungalows for three quarters of a million, a million dollars in some cases. Unbelievable. How does a young, how does a young family with a couple of kids get into that? Where they're working at least a couple of jobs each. A couple of jobs each and a 99 year mortgage. Maybe they'll have to come up with that. You pass the debt on to your children. Yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, we moved here. Our car insurance was cut in half. Um, yeah. We bought some land that used to belong to my dad. Um, we would never been able to do that in Ontario. Whatsoever. Yeah, and I guess you know the great the great rush to the urban areas that happened from basically the 1930s through to about 2000 is just going to spread back out again because bet, there's yeah. no other option. There's no other option. 
But I mean, you, I mean, the, the big problem here on the island is a lot of people are moving here from away because they don't want to struggle in Ontario anymore. They can sell their yeah. house for a million dollars in Ontario, move here, get a house two times the size of what they've got in Ontario for a fraction of what they sold the house for. So why wouldn't yeah, you and, do it? And not have to lock your doors. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, you can't blame yeah. someone for wanting to do that. Yeah. No, no, I think it's the only thing that, makes sense emotionally and it makes sense economically and you know pei is a charming place with a lot of history a lot of great and, music too oh god yeah i mean it's it's great and I, I mean that's why i'm not in vancouver i didn't want to bring my kids up in a basement suite. and i am a no. musician after all and musicians make basement suite money yeah so yeah. How are the kids yeah. now? Are they all, they're all grown up, I'm guessing, now? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my younger is 25. The older one is 29. He'll be 30 in April. Um, he has three. My older one has three sons, so I'm grandfather three times over. Oh, wow. That's yeah. a whole new aspect. Yeah. <laughs> Having and grandchildren. It, 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 turns out, it turns out that I was born to be a grandfather. I had no idea. <laughs> no idea whatsoever. So are you still in contact with the rest of the guys, too? in spirit yeah oh we talk constantly so where's everybody else where's jeffrey these days what's he up to uh jeffrey is well he does uh he still plays with the paper boys he does a lot of sessions he's got a little studio in his basement and he can play and you know like send you know mm -hmm. just send the tracks to other people so he's doing quite a bit of that which is it's not as easy to do that as a drummer because you've got to have um yeah big area and lots of microphones but he's got one really great microphone and uh and okay. some good input gear and he he records like that uh he's still in north vancouver he'll okay. never leave there i don't think in deep co and uh okay. tobin's in uh, victoria and he'll be there probably the rest of his life and he's doing really well is he still playing music as well or, or i think he plays a bit but he's producing a lot of stuff he works for a, a company that 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 does uh it's called band in a box okay and uh he's one of their main producers i think he might be their chief head producer and he so he goes all over the world he, he shills the product at trade mm -hmm. shows and he goes out and he he'll find some great guitarist or some great percussionist or whatever and say can you come in and do recording for us that we chop up and turn into patterns okay. and they do it and you know so he, he's now producing people that are like legendary musicians Right. And he does. He does this like it's, it's another day. It's another day for him. And how's uh, Matthew doing? What's he doing now? Well, Matthew is. Uh, he's always been a luthier. Mm -hmm. So he he's you know he, he can build guitars. He can maintain and fix guitars. But I think one of his main things is to maintain all the instruments for the Winnipeg Symphony. Okay. Or any other symphonic player who wants to, you know, take the risk of shipping his equipment to him. Right. Um, so he, he's exquisitely talented in that way, and he can rebuild or change instruments or tune them up, or you know, he can he can actually get in there with with a scalpel and fix stuff. Yeah, I saw a video recently of the guy who looks after Willie Nelson's guitar. <laughs> if you ever get a chance to watch it, it's quite oh humorous. That guitar looks like it should have been thrown out years ago, but this guy yeah. does a work job on it every year for him. Oh yeah, well, I mean. It's become his trademark now, but it's it's past its prime. <laughs> How's Hugh doing? Where's Hugh these days? Hugh is in Perth, Ontario. Uh, okay. He does he does a lot of uh, musical stuff um, remotely, once again, because okay. he's he, you know he's not a drummer, so he can do stuff. He does mixing. He does mm -hmm. uh, a lot of bass and mandolin and stuff for other people, and he tours occasionally. Uh, I don't know. He he wasn't. You know, during COVID, it became impossible to tour. So I really yeah. don't know if he's got any live gigs um, since COVID. And dur during COVID, he had none. It's right. difficult. I checked out his son on your recommendation. He's a talent. Oh, my God. These kids, you know, Tobin's, Tobin's son, uh, uh, Ellis. Mm -hmm. Glorious talent. Glorious talent. And, and Kieran and Galen, both of Hugh's sons incredibly mm -hmm. talented my son sammy not not as could have been a serious professional but he's not but he's just 
such a beautiful guitar player and nice songwriter. Right. And, you know, and then uh, Matthew's kids are, are younger, but they're going to be deeply involved in music too. They're are still in. John's kids play at all? Uh, no. Uh, Harlan did have some interest. Like he loves music, but he's not playing music. And, and Hattie is a, is a nurse. Okay. So she hasn't got time for music. She's saving lives, man. Oh, the Sound Academy in Toronto. I remember seeing her on stage with you guys. Right. Uh, yeah. John's daughter was on stage with you guys. Yeah, yeah. I think because she was in Toronto she, at the time. She was going to U of T. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of nice to have her there with the guys, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, I mean, all the kids are uh, really, really talented. And, I mean, we were pretty freaking talented for our generation. But they are going to make us look like just dinosaurs they're so good uh second generation spirit coming up <laughs> well we already kind of stuck them together as a little uh notional group for one event and yeah. uh, they could they could easily do it they won't but they easily could would you guys ever get together and do something again maybe it's probably hard without john but well would we would ever... never we would never go out as spirit of the west with some new singer no, for sure. No, but not a chance. I was thinking about but some one-off stuff you might get together. We might do a one-off where we could do a special special event for, uh, uh, you know, perhaps an Alzheimer's charity. We've for done sure. a few of those. And have a, a rotation of singers or get the kids in or, you know, do something like that. But it would have to be part of a greater event where we could, where we wouldn't have to hold down a show because it's just not the same. No, it's, it's not. It's just not the same. I did like the re-recording of Home for a Rest with everybody you got on it, all the guests. That was that was. Oh, amazing. that was Alan, Alan's uh, Alan Doyle's thing. Yeah, I got I, to, I, I got I, to he meet did him it. here. He was at a Charlottetown Islanders hockey game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gets uh, around. Yeah, nice fellow though. He oh, was he's a, a tremendous fella. I, you he know, he told me to say hi to you actually. Oh, good. Thank I you. I told him I chat with you once in a while. He goes, say hi to him. So. He um, of all the all the famous people in um, Canadian music, he's the hardest working one. He's always Absolutely. moving. Always he's moving. always moving. He never says no. He always finds a way to, to give you what you need in some mm -hmm. way. He, he is ceaseless in his efforts. He is such a pro. Yep. He's a, he's a great singer. I like his music and he's got a great fiddle player too. So. He's got the, the sweetest fiddle player in the world of spirit. Well, I can't believe you did this for me. You're my first interview. Um, I, I really appreciate you doing this. I mean, you and, oh, I chat, you, you and I have chatted off and on online over the years, and I appreciate the... Oh, we've been pals for 20 years. So. And I hope you make it out here someday. Oh, I would love to. I would love to. Yeah, and you better look me up. <laughs> well, okay, I will. Well, I don't know anybody else at PEI. <laughs> You will after I, you're done. You will after I'm done with you. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. we'll have to take. Okay, you up my there. man. We'll have to take you up to the Skinner's Pond Stomp and Tom Center. Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah, it's quite a spot. There's a live fun. music venue up there too. So, cool. So, thank you very much for doing this. You're uh, my pleasure. Um, hope to hear from you soon. Okay. And I'll post this soon. And uh, I sent you an invite to the group, so hopefully you join and check it out. Um, I will. Anyway, it's it like I said, I can't it's nice to talk to you face to face too. Well it's good to see you and make sure you buy my book. Of course. So I'm gonna check and Tell Indigo. everybody. Tell everybody. Oh I will. I'm gonna see if Indigo had this one here in Charlottetown, so I'm gonna see if the second one's in now. It wasn't okay. the last time I went, but I'll be checking for it. Okay. Well um, you can just ask them and they'll bring it in. For sure. Yeah. So anyway, great again, great to talk to you. Thank you so much for doing this and uh okay. Take care. All the best to you and the spirit guys and your families. Thank you very much. And best to you and your wife. Thank you. Take care. Okay, bye.